um, we have our last session of the day. We're here at uh, session 2C uh, titled Nitrogen Removal Optimization at Bellingham. Uh, if you need CEUs, we have Alexander at the back who can stamp your sheets for you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Anne Conklin. Dr. Conklin is a principal technologist at Corolo Engineers and has 17 years of experience in facility planning and wastewater treatment process modeling. She joined Corolo after earning her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Washington. Please help me welcome Anne to the stage. All right, thank you. Okay, so it's the green button. All right, over there, Trey. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, this work was conducted with Steve Bradshaw from the city of Bellingham, Adam Klein from Brown and Caldwell, and Susanna Long and Tag Diesberg also from Corolla. Sorry, Adam Klein's from Brown and Caldwell if I didn't say that correctly. All right, let's see if you got this. Okay, so in this talk, I wanna start with a background of the Post Point uh, wastewater treatment plant and how the 2022 Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit impacts that plant. I'll then launch into a discussion of the nitrogen optimization investigation that we conducted. We started with a brainstorming session and that was followed by an evaluation of the three most promising alternatives and then wrap it up with a discussion of the next steps. So on each of my slides, I provided this bar at the top um, do you have a pointer? Let me see if it's testing. Oh, nope. Okay. Writing that bar at the top, it can act as a wayfinder. If you find yourself dozing off in this presentation, you can look up and see where we are along the path of the talk. All righty. So the city of Bellingham's Post Point Water Resource Recovery Plan was upgraded to provide secondary treatment in the 1990s, and then expanded again in 2018 to expand that secondary treatment capacity. Treatment is provided with um, screening and grit removal upstream of primary clarification. The primary effluent is pumped up to the new anaerobic selector that then flows to the new activated sludge basin number one. Flow from that basin is then split to the three downstream basins, activated sludge basins two through four. The secondary effluent is then disinfected and discharged to Bellingham Bay. The primary sludge and the waste activated sludge are combined and thickened on gravity belts. That's then dewatered with centrifuges and incinerated. Typical for plants, discharging to Puget Sound, post point does not nitrify and does not have to meet any did not have to meet any nutrient limits. So in, 22, in 2022, the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit was issued with a goal of controlling the total inorganic nitrogen load to Puget Sound. Um, this started with um, action levels for all of the dischargers that essentially cap the nitrogen load at their current levels. In addition to these action levels, the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit also required a nitrogen optimization plan, which is what I'm gonna be talking about here, as well as annual reporting and a nutrient reduction evaluation to look at how each of these dischargers could get to effluent concentration as, as low as three milligrams per liter. So by design, post point, historic effluent nitrogen load is pretty close to that action level. They set the levels <laughs> to hold everyone at their current levels. So there's not a lot of wiggle room here. This graph is plotting the yearly effluent nitrogen, total inorganic nitrogen load from post point um, for the years 2017 through 2020. And in the gray line, I've overlaid the action level for post point, which is at 993,000 pounds per year. So those lines are pretty close. Um, important to note, though, that this line was based off of once per month sampling, and we're assuming that that is an accurate representation of their effluent nitrogen load. So if we just kind of play this out, we can see that it's pretty possible that post point could exceed their action level within the first five years of the permit cycle if they don't make any changes to the process. So this is the same graph that I showed previously, but now I've extended out the x-axis 
to have the entire 20 years of the planning period. That blue box there represents the five years of the permit cycle. So the first five years of the permit cycle. Um, the gray line is still the action level for post point at 993,000 pounds per year. And now I've added on a green line, which is our projection if nothing changes. So just based off of growth, and we can see that within the first five years, the green line is past the gray line. Um, just other note, this green line is based off of the growth projections documented in the city's comprehensive plan. We're also assuming that influent per capita loads remain at their current average value. So this is the basis of our planning that were used in the nitrogen optimization study. So uh, in addition to growth, aging infrastructure is compounding post points ability to comply with the action level in the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit. Chief among that is their incinerators. They have two. One was installed in 1974. One was installed in 1993. Both are reaching the end of their useful life. They are expensive to repair and maintain, and they have limited capacity for growth. So the biosolids plan, which was ongoing while we were doing this evaluation, evaluated the continued use of the incinerators, as well as switching to a new technology, namely anaerobic digestion. So of these two technologies, a switch to anaerobic digestion has a pretty profound impact on the, city, on the city's ability to stay under the action level, which was already pro problematic to begin with. On the, the figure on the, uh, my directions right, <laughs> the figure on the um, left is showing the city's existing incineration process. And in that process, the biosolids that are sent to the digester, the nitrogen is released to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. We can compare that with an anaerobic digestion process. The biosolids go to the digester, it releases the nitrogen in the form of ammonia, and that comes back to the liquid stream and in the dewatering return. This dewatering return can increase the um, nitrogen load to the liquid stream process by upwards of 30%. So we can see kind of what that looks like on that original plot that I've been showing. Now I've overlaid a blue line, which is showing what that 30% really looks like. So as with the green line, we are still passing beyond the action level of 993,000 pounds per year, but now that delta is much, much higher. So at the end of that first five years, the 2027 timeframe, there's a pretty big gap that would need to be filled. And it's unlikely that optimization alone could get this, the city under the action level of 993,000 pounds per year. So because of this, we looked at combining anaerobic digestion with side stream treatment. Um, the picture that I'm, the schematic that I'm showing here is for a demon process that what, that's, this is one example of a technology to effectively reduce the nitrogen in that side stream. In this demon process, the dewatering return is fed to an um, Animox reactor. Um, this reactor is intimately, that's not the word I wanted to use, intermittently aerated <laughs> with dissolved oxygen concentrations ranging from 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per liter. This environment encourages the growth of the AOBs, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, which convert ammonia to nitrite, and the anaerobic ox ammonia oxidizing bacteria, the anamox bacteria, which convert the residual ammonia and the nitrite to nitrogen gas. A uh, demon process can be operated as a flow through or a sequencing batch reactor. This schematic is showing a sequencing batch reactor. So the mixing and aeration are uh, periodically stopped and the slicker settles. The clarified effluent that's denitrified is then sent back to the liquid stream. The solids that settle out of the process are sent to a solid separation system like a, a, a cyclone and the fluffy material slicks it out. The granules are continually enriched so that these slow growing animox bacteria can stay in the system. So it's a pretty nifty process to reduce the nitrogen load in that side stream. So final time I've been, I'm gonna use this graph. The final line is that red line, which is showing what we might project for um, the nitrogen load through the planning period with anaerobic digestion coupled with the side stream treatment process. So in summary here, what we found is regardless of the city's 
approach for solids treatment, there is a chance that they're going to exceed the action level within the first five years of permit cycle if they don't make any changes to their liquid stream process. Additionally, optimization coupled with either an incineration process or anaerobic digestion with side stream treatment, it's likely that uh, we'll be able to close that gap. It's a small enough gap. So now moving on to talk about nitrogen optimization. So in most biological treatment plant, plants, nitrogen removal happens in the secondary treatment process. So we're gonna really focus this discussion on the secondary treatment process at post point. As I mentioned previously, post point does not have to nitrify. They do not nitrify. In fact, they intentionally do not nitrify because they do not have an ability to dose alkalinity. So they operate at solid retention times between two and three days. Um, with the anaerobic selectors followed by the activated sled stations, they operate in an anaerobic oxic or AO configuration. We can then compare that with um, a more conventional approach for removing nitrogen. I'm showing here at MOE schematic. Um, in this approach, the uh, insulate or primary effluent is sent to an unaerated zone followed by an aerobic zone. In the aerobic zone, the SRT is held long enough so that we can allow for the growth of the slow growing nitrifiers. In the Puget Sound area, this could be anywhere upwards of um, five to 10 days to allow for those nitrifiers to grow. So that represents a two to three, a factor of two to three increase in the inventory above what Post Point is currently operating. Um, that nitrate that's produced in the aerobic zone is then sent back to the anoxic zone uh, through two paths. Um, one of them, the lesser path would be the, through the RAS stream. And the second path is through an internal mix with a return, typically set at two to four times the insulin flow. So we can compare a traditional approach to remove nitrogen, which is MOE schematic, with what the city currently has, which is an AO. And we can see that the city has the backbone for nitrogen removal. They've got an unaerated zone followed by an aerobic zone. So they've got that already. Where, where the two are different is that currently the city operates at a very low solid retention time, and they do not have the ability to send the, the mix of return, the internal mix of return. So in order for post point to remove nitrogen, they're gonna have to nitrify. And in order for post point to nitrify, they're gonna have to run at a higher SRT. So these nitrifiers are slow growing, but they are pretty impacted by temperature. Um, so in this plot, I'm showing the wastewater temperature for post point. It's the minimum monthly temperature. I mean, it's not rocket science, but in the summer, the wastewater is hotter, as you'd expect. Um, and during this summertime, the nitrification rates are higher. And so in the summer, post point can nitrify at lower overall SRT. Now this still represents a doubling of the SRT over what they're currently operating, but it's not like a tripling of the SRT. So this, this is promising. But in order for post point to run at these higher SRTs, they need to hold a higher inventory. And in order to hold a higher inventory, they need to do this when peak flows are low. So wastewater temperature is not the only important factor. We also have to look at peak flows. So I've overlaid on this graph the peak day flow over the course of the year in red on the right y-axis. And again, this is not rocket science. In the Puget Sound region, it's warm and dry in the summer. And we can see that there is an optimum period for nitrification at post point between June and September. During these months, the wastewater is warm, nitrification rates are higher. Peak flows are also low, so the plant can run at a higher inventory without risking washing out the secondary firefighters. So that's good news. So now we know that between June and September, this is a good period to try nitrification. Um, and in fact, that first step in nitrogen removal, the conversion of ammonia to nitrate, that's not limited. In fact, there's some summers when post point struggles to stay out of nitrification. What's limiting the overall nitrogen return other than alkalinity is the returning the nitrates back to the anoxic zone. And so the brainstorming session that we conducted was really focused 
for the summer months on how can we get more nitrates back to the unaerated zone? And the first obvious answer is, well, put in the internal mixed return pump station. That would do it. So we look at that. This is a schematic of the post-plant treatment plant, their existing treatment process. Um, and I alluded to this in the beginning. Post-plant has an unaerated zone followed by their first activated sludge basin that then goes to three downstream aeration basins. So to do to put in an internal mix like a return, it's going to be that blue dashed line. So we go from the end of aeration basins two through four around the off leaf golf park area and back into the um, unaerated selector, the anaerobic selector. So this is possible. The issue with this is there's a lot of constraints on the site. And the one that's most important and most impactful to putting in the internal mix like a return is this heron rookery. This is the only plant where this is a problem, but it's a significant problem here. In order to site this internal mix like a return pipeline would require significant um, permitting and a very tight construction window. Because of that, it was deemed that adding an internal mix like a return was going to be too costly, take too much time, and really not be in the spirit of optimism. So that was discarded. So if we can't bring more nitrate back during the summer months by adding internal mix like a return pump station, what else is there? So the first thing we looked at, well, well, we've got RAS pumps and the summer flows are low. Maybe we can just run those RAS pumps full out and maximize the denitrification through the RAS pumps. That's one idea, completely feasible. The second idea was, well, if that's not enough, can we upsize? Is there ex ex uh, capacity in the whole RAS system to allow for larger pumps? Totally feasible idea. Um, the final one was, well, what about the drain pump? Right now, the city has a 3MDD drain pump that in their chlorine contact basins that they routinely use during low flows to send flow, to increase the flow through the process so that they don't get slow uh, mixed liquor settling out in the splitter boxes. So that's a way that we can return nitrate to the process. And there's also the aeration basin drain pump. Given the size of these drain pumps, it was decided that this alternative, although feasible, would be tabled in favor of evaluating um, using the RAS pump. So that was all focused on the summer months when nitrification is not limiting. It's a totally different story when we talk about the winter months. In the winter, the wastewater is cold and there's a lot of flow. We know from previous efforts that Post Point does not have the capacity to nitrify during the winter. So if they can't even do the first step in the winter, what can they do? So in the brainstorming session, we asked the question, well, how can we just reduce the load to the plant? If we can't nitrify, how about we reduce the load? First, are there any in significant industries that are contributing nitrogen? Could we implement something like chemically enhanced primary treatment to knock out some of that particulate organic nitrogen? and just reduce the load a little bit. We talked with the city, there is no significant industrial sources of nitrogen, so that option was out. Um, there is really not a significant particulate organic nitrogen fraction in the influent. So the effectiveness, effectiveness of SEPT was really limited and we are a little bit nervous about implementing SEPT it can remove colloidal BOD, which we would need for a biological nitrogen removal process anyway. So we decided that was not a good idea. So if we can't reduce the nitrogen coming into the secondary treatment process, can we improve the nitrification capacity? So there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can increase the temperature. So make the nitrifiers grow faster. This was deemed to be way too expensive for an optimization strategy, so that was out. The second is we can increase the inventory. So we can increase the inventory by increasing the volume. This again, also not in the spirit of optimization. This means building a whole nother activated sludge train. And we can increase the inventory by improving the settleability of the mixed liquor. 
if we improve the settleability of the mixed liquor, then the city can run at a higher mixed liquor concentration, thereby a higher SRT. Now, the city has spent the last, I want to say, since I've been at Quo, so 17 years working on controlling the SBI and their treatment plant, and they've done a really, really good job. The settleability at Post Point is great. So in order to further decrease the SBI, we're talking about implementing something like an indent process. And while this will certainly reduce the SBI and allow the plant to operate at higher mixed liquor concentrations, this is also not in the spirit of an optimization strategy. This would be pretty expensive. So then the final one on the table is decreasing peak flow. Um, this is similar to SBI. If we can decrease the peak flows, we can run at a higher mixed liquor concentration, thereby a higher SRT and have more capacity for nitrification. First thing that comes to mind is equalization tanks, also not in the spirit of optimization. But what about the collection system? The city has a pretty big collection system. Is there any capacity to equalize the flow in the collection system, thereby reducing the peak flows to the treatment plant? This one was interesting. So this one we carried forward. So in the end, looking at the summer and the winter, three alternatives were carried forward for evaluation. The first one that I just mentioned was modulating the pump stations and the collection system to use the collection system as storage and reduce the peak flow to the treatment plant. The second one we evaluated was how much extra capacity can we put into that rise pump station? Is there any ability to increase the uh, capacity easily? And the final one was really focusing, what can we do with what we've got? Focusing nitrification between June and September with their existing lab capacity. So move on to talking about that first alternative where we use the pump stations in the collection system to equalize the peak flow. So we used our collection system module model to look at modulating the flow through the Oak Street pump station. So for post point, 85% of the flow passes through the Oak Street pump station. So this is a good point to look at control. Um, in our um, collection system model, we ran three storms through that model, the November 2004, the June 2019, and the June 2020 storms. These storms had flows to post point ranging from 40 to 60 MDD, so these were sizable events. In addition to these three storms, we also took the November 2004 storm and scaled it to represent a one and two year and a one and five year storm event and ran those through the collection system model. So there's a lot of information here. I wanted to start by stepping through that first row, which is the November 2004 storm. It'd be really nice if I could figure out their pointer. I still don't know how to do it. Oh, got it. Right. Okay. So for the November 2004 storm, um, we can see that we go towards a certain point. Um, so the, for the November 2004 storm, the total flow to the treatment plant was about 43.4 MDD. Just, that's just the flow to the treatment plant. If we look at modulating the pumps in the Oak Street pump station, we can reduce that peak flow to about 42 and a half MDD. So we have a one MDD reduction. So that's not a lot. Um, and this was pretty common for the other events that we looked at. We found reductions ranging from a half an MDD for the November 2004 event that was scaled to the one in five year event up to about six MDD for the June 2019. And that six MDD reduction is nothing to sneeze at. That, that seems promising um, until we consider that Post Point is a CSO facility, flows above a certain point to bypass secondary treatment. So for the November 2004, June 2019, in June 2020 events, the flows exceeded the capacity of the secondary treatment process, regardless if we were modulating the flows in the pump station or not. So actually the flows going through the secondary treatment process were exactly the same for these three storm events for before and after. So after we realized this, we did not pursue this alternative anymore. It had limited capacity and was a little bit risky. Once you're modulating the 
flows through the pump station, you're risking having a CSO event, which nobody wants anyway. So on to the second alternative, where we are looking at how much capacity, can, how can we increase the capacity of the RAS pump station to send more nitrate back to the unaerated zone? So the RAS pump station has a firm capacity of 15 MGD, total capacity of about 20 MGD. The force mains have a capacity of 25 MGD. So there's not a lot of capacity. There's not a lot of ability to increase the capacity within this system very easily. To increase the capacity, what we're looking at is needing to increase the pump suction, suction and discharge piping size along with having larger pumps. So this feels outside of the spirit of nutrient optimization and was also discarded. So now we are left with one, which is nitrification and denitrification during June through September with the existing RAS capacity that they have right now. Um, we used our calibrated whole plant model to look at the ability to denitrify with that existing RAS capacity and found that optimiz like optimization should allow Coast Point to remain under their total interagonic nitrogen action level through 2027 even if they were to switch to anaerobic digestion with sidestream treatment. So the majority of the increase in nitrogen from anaerobic digestion, as we talked about, could be handled with sidestream treatment. And then the remainder of that increase, plus the anticipated growth, could be handled with summer-only nitrification and denitrification. We evaluated two different periods. So originally, we were talking about June through September representing a four month period, we found that we could stay under the action level in 2027 with nitrification and denitrification during this time period. But we asked the question, you know, what, you know, that means that if they're nitrifying in June and they're coming into nitrification in May and peak flows are high and wastewater temperature is kind of low in May, that seemed a little bit scary. So, what if we truncated the window? Could they still stay under the action level? So if instead of coming into nitrification in May, what if we're coming into nitrification in June? So if we're coming into nitrification in June and we've got July through September, we also found that we could stay under the action level of 993,000 pounds per year um, with just three months of nitrification. So this was really promising, except um, that we found that Nitrification is going to be limited by alkalinity. And this is something that I mentioned previously. The plant stays out of nitrification because they don't have the ability to build alkalinity. So we already knew that this was um, could be a problem. This plot that I'm showing shows a probability distribution curve for the primary effluent alkalinity concentrations in the summer. About 50% of the time, the alkalinity is about 175 milligrams per liter. It's not a lot. We ran their measured influent alkalinity concentrations through our dynamic model, which represented a, a year of operation. Um, the red line is showing the, the pH, and we can see when nitrification starts, the pH drops. And that's because when nitrification starts, the effluent alkalinity is basically non existent. So there's just not enough alkalinity here to drive the process. So because the risk of because the this risk is real and having the pH drop could cause the whole process to spiral out of control, we are not recommending that post point try nitrification without having an alkalinity built in system. In addition to alkalinity, we also looked at the capacity on the air system. So nitrification requires more air. So we found that they may have sufficient capacity in their blowers and diffusers. Their blowers have a capacity, a firm capacity of about 14,000, total capacity about 21,000 SPFM. At 2027, what we're seeing is average airflows of about 8,000, so under the firm capacity. Peak airflows are a little bit scarier, um, ranging from like exactly equal to the firm capacity to less than the total capacity, but greater than the firm capacity. So this is kind of a maybe, depending on the timing of the peak loads and the peak, peak BOD loads, peak ammonia loads, and the plant's ability to operate with lower dissolved oxygen concentrations, that this might work. Um, we also looked at the diffusers. 
their basins are not set up to nitrify right now. They have diffuser densities ranging from 17% to 5%. Uh, we found that the most critical spot along the aeration basin path was in aeration basin one. So that first basin that all the flow goes through and the final two, so it's like the sec, the, like a third, two thirds of the way down and all the way down. So it's zone two and zone three, although there's no back. So just the final end of the, that zone. Um, and to lessen the load on those diffusers, we found that the plant would have to operate with all their activated flood stations in service to shift some of that load away from that first activated flood station. Um, this is not normally, this is not how the plant likes to operate. They like to have an aeration basin offline during the summer to perform preventative maintenance. So this, this is not ideal that they could do this. Um, we found air flows per diffusers or air fluxes in these critical zones during average conditions ranging from one and a half to two SDSM per diffuser. So, okay, but kind of on the high side. Under peak conditions ranging from three to four SDSM per diffuser. So, again, okay, but kind of on the high side. So, this is an ideal, but it could be workable. So, the next step for the city of Bellingham, um, we've, we've looked at a whole world of alternatives to optimize their treatment plant. We found three, only three viable alternatives. We evaluated modulating the pump station, um, pumps in the, the collection system to equalize the flow. We found that this one had very minimal impact and risk having a CSO, which wasn't ideal. Uh, we looked at increasing the capacity of the RAS pump station. We found that this was gonna be pretty expensive to upgrade. And the final one was nitrification during the summer months with what they've got. Um, and although this will work and we think it will keep the city under their action level, it will require a capital investment. They'll need to put in the alkalinity feed system and the city may find that they want more blowers or diffusers to allow for more optimal operation during this time. So capital projects of this magnitude may not fall within the Puget Sound nutrient general permits definition of an optimization effort. So we're talking about real capital expenditure here. So the city is evaluating the feasibility and timing of implementing capital projects to control nitrogen. All right, that was my last one. I, oh, I think I have time for questions. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I have a microphone for you. Uh, we're live streaming, so. Thank you, great presentation, by the way. Um, I might've missed it when I first came in. What's the overall capacity of this facility and how close is it to needing an upgrade? So right now, Post Point has a lot of capacity. So in 2018, the plant was expanded to provide liquid stream capacity through 2040. So they right now operate with, see if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you operate with two of your basins offline at all times. So they've got extra capacity, which is why they've got options. Um, they can increase the SRT in the summer to, to nitrify. Hold on a second. So what was preventing, so the Heron Rookery was preventing some, some piping with the MLR pump to be able to move MLR back to a different area. What, what was preventing that piping? Like, is there a little more specifics on how that piping wasn't able to be routed due to the Rookery? Oh, and, there's and, like a whole story associated with that, that I'm not, I don't know all the details. So in the 2018 expansion, they, they needed to go into area that was gonna impact the Heron Rookery. And it was problematic. Um, it ultimately worked out. They had, um, they had a tight window of time that they could be in that area. I think they had a noise ordinance, is that right? They had to stay under a certain, noise level so that they wouldn't scare away the herons. Um, and it all worked. Like I remember talking to Susanna who was the project engineer on the project during this time. Um, 
and the herons were there beforehand. And then after the project, the herons came back. Everyone's super happy. The rookery survived through that project, but no one's super excited about doing this again. Um, so I think it's feasible. I just don't know if it could happen within the time frame that would be needed to keep them under the action level. Mm -hmm. I just echo that. Yes. So why can't we come off? Hold on a second. Why can't we... So A, B's two, three, and four mm -hmm. go into the mixed liquor line, which goes to the secondaries, mm -hmm. right? Why can't we come off of there and go down and dump it into the splitter box for the primaries, which eventually ends up back in the system again, and you never even go near the heron rookery, or go between basins four and three, which, because the route you showed, everything in the world is in that route. I mean, you can't dig through there but you could dig through between basin two and the, and the primaries. Okay. So where the tunnel is. I can answer part of that question, but not all of that question. So Susanna was the one that was involved in the facility planning when they laid out this pipeline. And so I'm sure there's a reason why it has to be in the configuration it's in. Dumping into the primaries is not super ideal because now we have the mixed liquor in the primaries and it's, we're, the primary clarification performance is gonna suffer. And of their treatment process, they don't have a ton of extra primary clarification capacity. They've got a lot of secondary capacity, but not a lot of extra primary clarification capacity. I'm not sure why the, a different route couldn't be chosen though. And I can get back with you on that. Yeah, here at Rookery, so we built the secondary clarifier from the outside wall to the north. Yes. So you can put the pipeline in and do it. You just yes. have to work around the Rookery back. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it happens. Yeah, you can do it. Right. The way understanding and talking with Susanna is it can happen. Just there's people aren't super excited about doing that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, a lot of the talk is about the um, capital improvements that will need to be put in place for alkalinity supply. What about looking at that in more of a short-term strategy on the operational budget, maybe with a third-party chemical supplier or something of that nature? It gives sure. you a short-term solution that could prove out the concept, for example. Like, are you thinking a temporary alkalinity feed system, something of that, that nature? Yeah, you know, you have a system in place that it's, I guess, ultimately, it's not necessarily the way you like to go, but it's not owned by the plant itself, not owned by the facility, so it's not capital expenditure up front, and you're only using it for, by the sounds of it, a few months of the year. That, that is not something that we have considered. Um, at this point, what, um, how we've proceeded is we're going to need to, for, night, for post point to night device, we're going to need alkalinity. And so the first step was really trying to understand the best way, the best source of alkalinity. Um, is that going to be caustic or lime? There's, if we add caustic, are we going to change the monovalent to divalent cation ratio and cause a poor quality flock that's not going to settle as well? So at this point right now, we're investigating what's the best source of alkalinity addition. And then the next step was going to be, what, well, what is this alkalinity feed system going to look like? So we haven't gotten that far yet. That is, that's a good idea. Does it, does it sound like the decision is on providing alkalinity? It's just a decision on how and what now then? The city's still figuring that out. Um, Want to make sure that they're providing a affordable solution. And, and make sure that this is part of their long-term plan for meeting whatever the ultimate nitrogen limits are gonna be, which are still a little bit uncertain. All right, um, thank you. That's all the time we have today. Thank you, Anne.